Greetings. I hope and trust I find you well. We have uh, one more theory to consider and for this installment, we'll be looking at the sanctity of contract theory. We've already covered the will theory where we looked at choice with consent. Choice with consent. Now, on sanctity of contract, you would remember we did refer to this briefly. And we said what sanctity of contract or legal certainty is, is that where we enter into transactions, the court is going to come to our aid should it so happen that one of the debtors in obligation is not cooperating as far as delivering on the terms of the contract. So on sanctity of contract, what we are going to look at is we do not necessarily go to the courts before we exhaust all remedies. And these remedies will be inclusive of number one, you could uh, have a situation where the parties renegotiate the terms of the contract or where there was a misunderstanding. They find each other. And to do so, they may go through what is uh, known as rectification. We did mention this in the previous installment where um, parties would say, no, no, in as much as we wrote this, this is not what we meant to agree upon. And uh, they work at uh, cementing that agreement. And then secondly, you could have a scenario whereby the parties are going to seek a third party who would not necessarily be a judge. It could be conciliation, it could be arbitration. All these are what would known would, would re commonly refer to as alternative dispute resolution. So this can be sought as a way of making sure that parties find each other and they move forward contractually together, according to the words of um, Justice Matonsi. Now, on the last part, you would find that um, if um, trying to find each other doesn't work, conciliation doesn't work, the innocent party, the aggrieved party, can seek redress through the courts, and this will be full-blown litigation. And uh, full-blown litigation generally is adversarial. Um, why do we say it's adversarial? Not that really it, um, in a court system, it uh, brings adversity, but in reality, it does bring adversity. But the way it is, is that, um, that there is one person who has to prove, the other one has to respond, so wh whoever alleges must prove. So the one who comes with the allegation proves that there is indeed been an infraction. There has been uh, a refusal to perform the obligations of the contract. And the one who is accused must then uh, mount a defense. So that is the adversarial form of uh, adjudication. An inquisitorial form of adjudication is whereby the judge is the one who will be uh, sort of interviewing, sort of uh, uh, putting you on... Um, or on the defense and asking you to, to supply more information. So that is the inquisitorial approach. So Zimbabwe using the, uses the adversarial approach. But that besides, what happens is there tends to be adversity in this adversarial approach. And what is the adversity that usually arises? After litigation, usually uh, relations do not remain the same. Um, I'm yet to find a situation where parties uh, went full-blown litigation and came out the best and better of friends. Usually, enmity is um, born out of it. And uh, besides that, it also costs a lot. Financially, you're going to be expending money towards getting lawyers and uh, appearing and uh, all that needs to be done. So before you go full-blown litigation and say, I'll sue you, just know that suing sounds in money. It is not just a word. You don't just say, I'll sue you. You, you pay to sue someone. And um, that besides, it does not mean all cases that are going to be taken to court are going to succeed. Some may, may have high prospects of success and some may have low prospects of success. And some may even be turned down because they have been filed in the wrong court where the court has no jurisdiction. And uh, when we look at even Luke chapter 12, the verses 13 to 14, we find a jurisdictional issue. You know, it reads as follows. And one of the company said unto him, this is a brother, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he, Jesus Christ, said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed 
and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. You know, um, this is wise counsel. As God blesses the reading of his word, may he bless us too. To appreciate that even though Christ makes a legal statement, I have no jurisdiction to address inheritance disputes. But my jurisdiction is on the moral law. And Christ says, as far as I'm concerned, covetousness and envy, take heed of them. For these are the things that spoil a man's life. Yet a man's life does not consist only of the things that he possesses, the things that he owns. But as we look at this, could it be possible that most, prob most property disputes arise as a result of envy? What are your thoughts? If we deal with envy, would, those, would this not really uh, decongest the court role? Most people, most probably, they are just uh, jealous to see others do better. And as a result, they'll rather just pull them down. Their PhD holders, pull them down theory. It doesn't matter what they are contending with, but they just can't afford to see others do well. And so they will not fulfill their end of the obligation. They will not. You know, we need to pray that the Lord may give us a spirit of contentedness and a spirit to be at peace with all men. I'm impressed to pray with you before we proceed. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for this instructive test. This text tells us that covetousness is something we should guard against. Envy is something we should worry about and make sure it is not found anywhere in our lives. In so doing, disputes will reduce. In so doing, we may clear the court rows. Be with us now as we go into this study. Impress upon us the nearness of your return. And above all, give us clarity and lucidity of mind to grasp all that we shall cover. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On um, contracts as we move on, contracts do not last forever. They come to an end. And the fate of contracts is that they can come to an end upon performance. That is the first one. So once a contract has been performed, it comes to an end. That is the logical thing. So you'd have a scenario where you walk into a shop. Uh, I gave an example of, okay, pick and pay, shop, right, Walmart, you name them. You walk into a shop or it's game. You, you have bought the produce that you are there for. Upon buying the produce and walking out, it's a perishable. If there is no defect on that product, Guess what? The contract has been performed and is complete. There is nothing that continues to subsist from the contract. Now, it would also remain uh, comatose, you know, not totally dead, not totally performed, where the contract provides for a guarantee or a warranty. So you could have a six-month guarantee, you could have a two-year guarantee, you could have a five-year guarantee, you could have a 10-year warranty that should anything else happen, Within that period, you can always come back. So it does not mean the contract has not been performed. It has been performed. But that particular term on the warranty continues to uh, exist until the period expires. So that particular clause is the only part of the contract that will survive, as it were. So when we look at uh, contracts in this case, uh, this is a straightforward performance. It's not repetitive. It's not like... Um, your rental, that is monthly, it's not like your salary and uh, remuneration, which is monthly. So even though you could have a monthly contract, you could say that repetitive uh, payment becomes a continual performance of the contract. So where it is contract co co performed at um, consistent intervals, that, 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 that would be unique. But now you'll have a scenario where it is a once-off upon being performed, there is no need for any further notice. It immediately expires. It immediately expires. So this is where you would have uh, your fixed contracts, where you are given a contract for a year. Uh, when the year expires, guess what? It has been performed. You have been at work. If there are no issues, you don't need notice. The contract is over. You go home. And number two, a contract would also expire at the death of another party to the contract. So what this simply means is, Common sense dictates that dead people do not perform contractual obligations. 
And this is the position of the law. The law simply says dead people cannot engage in valid legal acts. Now, let us digress a bit. It flies in the face of logic to expect a parent to continue to care for his or her dependent child from the grave as an ancestor. This is what the law simply says. It says, this does not make sense. As Africans, we, we are wont to believe this. But the law says, do not believe that nonsense. It does not work. And um, you may want to believe it and say, this is what we hold on to. Even if you do so, you're going to do so in your home. It is your right. But as far as the legal contract is concerned, it has no standing. Now let's go to the Bible. The Bible also adds and says, the dead know nothing. The dead know nothing. Their love, their hatred is all gone. The only people who can claim a, a hold of knowledge are those who are alive. But all those who are dead, they know nothing. So to even begin to entertain them in matters of payment of fees and seeking employment for their loved ones is preposterous. Don't even go in that direction. That's what the Bible says. But to show you how we are steeped in this kind of thinking and how we even want to misapply the law, in African traditional custom, you, you will notice that uh, on the day of interment, the day of burial, so when someone is being interred, you know there will be a moment after the burial is done where people are invited. If there are any, any persons here who are owed by the deceased, please come and see us. So what happens is those who they've been owed by the deceased, they come over to claim, to say, no, he, he, he owed me this, this and that, and then money is paid to that person. Now, what we usually happen, what, what usually happens is you find a scenario that legally, when the party dies, the obligation for now moves from the person and attaches to his or her estate. So that amount which is being paid is not necessarily being paid by the person, is being paid from his or her estate so as to serve as the creditors. Are we together? So you have this uh, uh, relative of yours who was supposed to be declared a prodigal <laughs> and not legally competent to transact. He has been borrowing all over and his estate cannot even begin to cover whatever he owes. So this is what happens. When you are now at the burial site, you are then told, uh, everyone, come, come, come. Let's put our monies together and settle our brother's debt. That particular practice where you find third parties now financing the debt of the deceased is not legal. If the deceased has no estate that we can claim from, that is where your contractual agreement perishes. To go to those widows that are in the rural homes, uh, drag their cattle so that you can service the debts of their sons and daughters is not legal, is not biblical, is not common sense. Your contract has expired. That is where it ends. It dies with the party. And if it doesn't attach to the estate, so be it. It's gone. It's gone. There is nothing you can do and you cannot be enforcing that contract upon the relatives. The same also applies, I feel like talking this morning. The same also applies to issues of pay, paying the dowry price, what we refer to as ilobolo or rora. The person who was supposed to pay the dowry price has died. And now you find that the dowry price is being demanded of the, the, the relatives that he survived by. And in some cases, you even find a situation whereby the child of the late is the one or the son of the late is the one who has to pay the dowry price for the father. How does that make sense? How does that make sense? So the contract was between the father and uh, the um, who is late and the, and the, and the family of the, um, or of, the, or of the surviving widow in this case. So how do you make a child pay the dowry price? It, it, it flies in the face of logic. I think uh, I would want to push and say, my African brothers and sisters, let us consider updating the law.
and going by way of um, a contract law and simply say, when the person dies, they die with the debt. So if they do not have an estate that is going to cover the debt, pray that all your debtors do not die. That is the best you can do. That is the Christian thing you can do. Do not be recovering from their relatives or recovering from their neighbors or attendees at their funerals. It is not fair. It is not fair. Now, the other thing that we're going to realize is that, first of all, we have said a contract will be performed and it would expire upon being performed. Number two, a contract would uh, terminate, meet its fate at the death of the, um, the party, the debtor in obligation to this contract and or be transferred to his or her estate. And if it does not attach to the estate because it is non-existent, the, the obligation pulverizes at that point. It moves from solid to a gaseous state. I'm taking you back to your science class. Now, at number three, a contract can um, also find itself um, terminated as it were because it has become unenforceable. So a contract that is unenforceable would have subsisted up to a certain point and then it becomes frustrated. I mean, literally in the, in the common understanding of being frustrated. So when you talk about being frustrated, you want to say what would have happened? An obstruction would come in, a supervening event. That's what it means. So this big word simply means an obstruction has arisen, which makes it impossible for the contract to be performed. Performance is on this other side. An obstruction has come in and blocked the completion of the contract. So what we want to look at is what are these kind of obstructions that can arise? Number one, it could be a law that has been gazetted and it could be um, an impossibility that would have arisen. Number three, we could have circumstances that would change such that should they change, these circumstances would make the performance of the contract something totally new that was not even anticipated to begin with. Now, as one looks at this frustration, there are two principles that must always hold constant, constant. For the parties to claim frustration, especially the one who wants to uh, seek out of the contract, number one, there must be a, scena a scenario where this particular obstruction was not introduced by that party or by either of the parties. For, for us to say the contract has been frustrated, whatever is the obstruction must not come from either of the parties. Number two, uh, building on number one. Neither of them should be at fault. So these are innocent people and they are being affected by issues or activities that are beyond them and outside their scope and sphere of control. So at A, what we have here is a supervening illegality. What is a supervening illegality? A supervening illegality is whereby the law changes in the course of doing business such that when the law has changed, to continue to perform the contract would result in an illegal uh, activity. So because of that change in the law, this is going to frustrate the contract. A couple of years ago, we had a scenario whereby uh, the law changed as far as the import fees are concerned. In the past, someone who would order um, equipment, even a car, usually, yeah, a car from outside um, the country. Anyway, you can't import from within yeah. Now, they, they import a car and you would generally use foreign exchange to pay for that import. Purchase, um, I mean, freight and all those kind of things. But when the person now had uh, to pay the, the taxes, custom taxes, the person had an option to pay in the local currency, the local tender. So the law changed in the course of uh, that. And this is what happened. It now became mandatory and a legal requirement that if you order a car in Forex, you'll need to service the bill in Forex. So the people were given a window period within which to transact. And it so happens that one um, Gentlemen, I, I think his car was actually stuck at the, the Blumtree border, just near to us here, Blumtree border. This gentleman, I remember at some point taking up issue with uh, 
Zimra throw the courts to challenge this law, to say um, he had actually transacted and uh, he needed to be exempt from, from this law because he had transacted within the set period. Now, what, what, what that simply means is that even though we had a scenario whereby um, the enforcers of the law would want to give you a second chance, would want to give you a reprieve, it might not be possible for them to do so. Why? Because of the supervening illegality. To receive those Azim dollars would be an illegal act. So there is a requirement that they need to receive the duties in Forex. That is the requirement. Now, you, you, you then could say, um, maybe uh, Mr. MK, in this case, Zimra and whoever is importing do not have a contractual relationship. Their relationship only begins at the time of servicing the required Jews. But imagine that you are an agent. And for some of those agents, they're going to ask you to make a pre-deposit, to deposit money towards the duties and all those kind of things. Imagine a scenario whereby you had received the money to clear in RTGS, in Zimbabwean dollars. Now comes time to um, service and perform. And lo and behold, the bank transfer that you received is no longer being accepted by the authority. So in that particular scenario, you would say we now have a supervening illegality. Because of the supervening illegality, the contract is frustrated. It is not enforceable. So even if you were to approach the courts and say, could you uh, compel this person, order this person to fulfill the contractual obligation, the courts cannot compel him or her to do so because of that unenforceability. Now, talking about a supervening illegality, I uh, would want to look at the recent case, I think as of two days ago, uh, on Saturday. The High Court uh, came to a determination on the 15th of May that uh, the Chief Justice, Luke Malaba, is no longer the Chief Justice upon reaching retirement age. And therefore, any acts, legal acts that he will transact in his office as the Chief Justice will be now and void and of no effect. And you would remember this very well, void up initio. Now, what happened here? Before, this is a supervening illegality. I want to give the background to say, how does this become a supervening illegality? Now, what happened is the, the government of Zimbabwe reviewed the constitution, statutory instrument of 2018, I mean, the, 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 the act of 2018, it, it reviewed it and extended the term of office for um, the judges so that they can retire at 75 instead of 70 years. So the constitution provides that anyone who is serving an incumbent cannot benefit from an extension of this term. And uh, Dr. Magaisa, Alex Magaisa, gave an interesting, an interesting write-up on this. I'm yet to read the full judgment so I'm basing much on what he said because uh, the, the press didn't quite give as much detail as he did. So what, what, what then happened is the president then decided to extend the term of office of the chief justice. And he did so um, just a few days before the chief justice turned 70. And that was on uh, it was just about two or three days ago. So this, as he puts it, he says it was a birthday present. You are turning 70, you should retire, and you're given a five-year lease of life in the office. So what happens is, um, uh, the, uh, was it uh, one of the NGOs, another civil person, um, they, they took issue with this and made an urgent application to the high court. And the high court found that the conduct of the president in extending that particular um, term of office was not legal conduct. Why? Because this particular person who is the incumbent should not benefit in terms of the constitution from an extension of a term in office. So what, did, what does this mean? We go back to the subject of the contract. Where parties, the extension of the contract, are, 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 are agreeing on an illegal event. 
This makes that particular act void ab initio. It is defective. It does not take off. It is void and absent initially. So the, the, the conduct of the president is not legally material. This is what the court has said. Now, let's say for one reason or another, we have a scenario where that particular conduct may have been um, uh, enforced maybe between last week and this week where the chief justice did some things. Now, what has happened now? Let's assume that contract had been extended. What it means is that as of Saturday, the 15th of May, a supervening illegality has arisen because of the court judgment the former, allow me to say former for now, until it's uh, set, I mean settled should it go up to the Constitutional Court. The, the former Chief Justice cannot engage in any legal transaction as an office bearer. So when he does so, there is now a supervening illegality. To do so would be illegal because the court has arrived at a decision and it is the High Court. It is making a decision not against um, his person, but against an office bearer. So he cannot discharge any functions as a chief justice anymore. There is that uh, interdict, there is that ruling that bars him from doing so, desist from doing so with effect from this day. So as of Friday, midnight, he turned 70 and he ceased to be the chief justice. So this is what a supervening illegality means. So this contract, this contract, should he come through to any court and say, I, I, I want to go on and uh, preside over this case, there is that illegality. He cannot do so anymore. But of course, we did mention that in the superior courts, all items that are constitutional, all items that are constitutional, the apex court would be the constitutional court. So in as much as the high court has made a ruling, on constitutionality. This is not a final position. And I said on civil matters, if you get it from the Supreme Court, it is better law. It is safe law to go with. So on constitutional matters, the Judicial Services Commission and um, the government have decided that they're going to appeal the decision as early as, next, uh, as early as this coming week. So I'm not too sure whether we can really uh, say this is settled law as yet. But it'll be interesting to follow and find out how this rolls out. So this is um, what we can say about a supervening illegality. But um, that besides, a supervening illegality should not be a scenario where it just shoots up every now and again at every turn. The law has changed. Professor Lone Fuller, this is where he now advances in that eight test. And he says the law should not change too frequently so that people are not able to order their lives for a foreseeable future. People must um, know what the law is today and anticipate that it shall remain the law for a long, long time. So we cannot have a scenario whereby the law would change as often as it can. You know, you cannot change the law as if you're changing your pair of stockings. That, that would not be proper. It would be difficult for anyone to keep up with the law. So on supervening illegalities, and we're going back to the Zimra case, so people need to be given notice, people need to know ahead of time what the law is going to be, and they need to then order their business accordingly. And um, that besides, uh, should we have a scenario whereby the, the illegality makes the contract unenforceable, what it simply means is that at that point, the contract is going to terminate and the parties are going to walk away with whatever they took from it. So even um, some of these um, issues that can arise can be supervening impossibilities. Supervening impossibilities would be um, an obstruction that arises outside the members, such as what you'd call a force major or a force majeure, that's what others call it, an act of God. It is not anticipated we have had a flood. We have had a bolt of lightning and it has struck a house where someone is renting or leasing. So when that house is raised down by fire as a result of a bolt of lightning, now in a situation where the tenant was supposed to remain in occupants for the whole year, you cannot demand that this person continues to pay 
the rentals. And neither can the tenant demand that the, 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 the one who was, um, in this case, the lesser and the lessee, the, the, the one who leased the property to you should uh, construct another house right next to it within two days where you're going to um, occupy and be and live with your family. That is a supervening impossibility, and I think it's common sense. So in this case, the contract cannot be enforced anymore, and um, this is uh, clear and straightforward. But on impossibility, we want to take um, uh, a moment to clarify that. It does not necessarily have to be difficult. It has to be impossible. So what is impossible is both difficult and not doable. But what is difficult is doable, but um, more expensive or demanding more exertion on the part of the one who is to do it. So when you enter into a contract and uh, there is a turn of events that makes performance expensive, you may renegotiate the terms of the contract, but that does not mean you can then turn around and claim that the contract has been frustrated. No, 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 it has not been frustrated. You still have an obligation to deliver. Now, um, we, we have uh, scenarios whereby uh, some of us, we are into uh, third party kind of business where we play the middleman. So as a middleman, you, you procure goods from A and you supply them to B. And you, I mean, you supply them to C and you are B in between. But you don't usually disclose to C that these particular goods that I'm giving to you, I'm getting them from A. You give the impression that you already hold the goods, everything is up to you, you have agreed on the price because you cannot be... Uh, revealing what your sources are. And while you're in the course of transacting, you have agreed on all the essential terms of the contract. Having agreed on the essential terms of the contract, it then so happens that A decides to review their prices upwards. But you've already made a commitment to C that you are going to supply the goods for so much. Now, it becomes difficult for you to uh, rescind that contract because you cannot do so because it has become difficult to do so. What you're supposed to do is reduce your markup and still provide the contracted performance. That's how you should work. That's how business is. But uh, this is why most of us uh, find it very difficult to land contracts because we agree to one thing and then the next moment we're renegotiating. When you agree to something, there is a consensus ad idem. The contract is sealed. What is left is performance. You cannot go back and say, sorry, I undercharged. Sorry, I did not anticipate this. It, it, it must be something that is um, an impossibility that would make us say it's unenforceable. Otherwise, the other party can sue for enforcement and you are going to be compelled to do so. You are going to be compelled to do so or alternatively pay damages. Let me end with an example. I, I think I have too many examples now. Now, let me end with an example of uh, education. We had a scenario whereby uh, students went to universities, 2019, COVID struck. 2020, it was on the rise. Now we're even nearing the third wave, which has started in South Africa. Now, um, what did this uh, result in? The government legislated that um, schools were going to shut down. But this meant that there was a supervening illegality. Secondly, it meant that uh, besides the supervening illegality, there was an impossibility to offer contact education. But in as much as it was an impossibility to offer contra I mean contact education, the, contractual, the, the subject of the contract is not necessarily contact education. The contact education is the quality of the subject of the or the, the, the subject that we have uh, bargained for. So education can still be offered online. So what that meant is that um, entities had to now see to it that they avail online education. This was difficult and it still it still is difficult because you need to have technological advancement in order to meet the requirements. You will need to expand more finances towards connectivity so that you can meet the expectations. And so to do this would become more difficult. Its difficulty does not make it impossible. 
That is why online education has been on the rise in some places where it was never going to be anticipated that this was going to be the mode of learning. So bottom line, it is something that has to be impossible. And secondly, unforeseen by both parties at the time that contract is entered into. So we cannot just say it is difficult and we cannot just say there is a frustration when we are at fault. The third one arrives from um, supervening, I mean, from um, impossibility. It is uh, supervening circumstances. So you could have a scenario where it's not external to the parties. Now, a, 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 an impossibility can be something that is an obstruction that is beyond the parties. But a change of circumstances has to do with the conditions or the holdings of um, the parties. So should those also change? you're going to have a supervening circumstance. A change of circumstances would make it uh, materially different. This is not what we contracted for. This is not what we contracted for in the beginning. So you could have a scenario whereby um, Solis University is a university conferring uh, enterprise. It's um, <laughs> a degree conferring enterprise, not a university conferring. It's a degree conferring enterprise. So... You have a scenario whereby the Minister of Higher Education decides that maybe the only university that is going to remain is the University of Zimbabwe. All other universities, you're going to be reduced to colleges. You can only uh, confer diplomas. The circumstances of the university would have materially changed in that case. And because of that change, what would this necessitate? Where you are going to find yourself being compelled to receive a diploma in, in accounting, a diploma in management, a diploma in marketing, uh, a diploma in computers and information systems instead of a degree. That change of circumstances makes the contract very, very significantly to the point that it is not what you would have contracted for to begin with. So that kind of a change would result in a contract being unenforceable because of a change of circumstances, a change of circumstances. You could have... Um, a change of circumstances where you become insolvent, where you become um, where you become um, broke. So you could have a situation whereby the university uh, shuts down because it has become insolvent, and uh, this will not happen in a thousand years until Jesus comes. <laughs> That's uh, prophesying now. Now, um, should the circumstances vary to that extent? Guess what would happen? Anyone else would have uh, expected to have uh, that degree conferred upon them. The circumstances would have changed. So you could have a situation whereby students are going to be transferred from one entity to go and finish off their degrees at another entity and be conferred with degrees from that particular place. So I, I think, uh, was it um, students from Great Zimbabwe? Uh, at some point, we had to transfer and finish off their programs at the University of Zimbabwe. The circumstances had changed. So that contract had been uh, frustrated, in other words. I, I, wish, I wish I had time to look it up, whether they were law students or medical medicine students. I can't remember which discipline it was. But those students had to be transferred and they had to complete their programs at another university. So I, I'm giving you education examples here. And then here is the other thing that would uh, result in uh, an end of a contract. This one we, we, we know very well. A breach of contract. A breach of contract. What have we covered so far? We have said, number one, performance of a contract will bring it to an end. Number two, we have also said the death of either of the parties will bring the contract to an end. Number three, the one we have just looked at is frustration, where the contract has to come to an end because it has become unenforceable. Number four, a breach of contract. Remember when we started off, we said you can have any, a re-engagement, you can seek conciliation. And lastly, you can go for full-blown litigation. Where there is a breach of contract, this is um, an abrogation. It has been broken. And uh, they, they, there are various stages of these breaches. And we want to look at these breaches. But before we do so, now, a, a breach of contract can, can arise where a party just decides to be unreasonable <laughs> and uh, refuse to, to do what they have uh, contracted to do. In that kind of a case, the, 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 the innocent party has no option but to seek legal redress 
so as to ensure that um, their rights, um, their 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 right does not go in vain. You know, the the person who is supposed to perform does perform. So the the court is going to then order a specific performance, and when it orders a specific performance, it compels the other person to do a positive act. But as this person does a positive act, the court has to tread a thin line. How does it tread this thin line? It cannot interfere with will theory. We said will theory is consent with choice. So the parties must consent and decide that I'm going to do this. So the, the court would order specific performance and give an alternative for damages. Now, you're going to remember the, the Morisi case that we looked at at the beginning where the, the labor officer, at some point, the Supreme Court had said the labor officer has um, no right to give an order for damages in lieu of reinstatement. <clears throat> and then, at a later point, the Supreme Court now then changed this position. It said, no, 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 that was bad law that we did as the Supreme Court, and it departed from an earlier decision and said, now, this is the law. The law is that where a judgment, a finding is handed down by a judicial officer, a judicial office, it must have the alternative of damages. And the labor officer should give that alternative. That is the legal position. What that simply meant, now we can discuss it. What that simply meant was the court was saying, in principle, we cannot be seen to override the will theory. People must consent to be in relationships and people must have the, op the option of pulling out. So when they are forced to remain in relationships, there ceases to be a free will in that. So they must be told, if you do, if you cannot remain in there, the option you can have is to do good by those you have led down the wrong path. This is where the sanctity of contract now comes in. Will theory says, I'm willing to be here. I'm here by choice. I have consented. There is consensus ad idem. I have not been coerced. There has been no duress. There has been no influence. There has been no misrepresentation. There has been no fraud. I am here because I choose to be here. Now, the same person is allowed to change their mind and say, I want out. When they opt out, they should not be compelled to remain in there because that would become a, an arrest. <laughs> People are not arrested into contracts. They are not confined in there. They are not imprisoned. They, they must have the option of out. When they exercise the option of out, this is where now they must make good. They cannot be unjustly enriched by what has been performed. So we must then say, even though it is difficult for us to proceed, now make good on what you have benefited. Make good on the losses that you have caused others to go into because of your change of mind. So this is where we come now to the breach of contract. Now, breach of contract has about four, four types, four types of breaches. The first breach that we're going to look at is a breach of contract, which this one is straightforward. A breach of contract is where the data and obligation fails to deliver totally on what has been contracted for. This person may fail to appear where they are supposed to be. They may fail to deliver the, the goods. They may just fail to do the task totally. Nothing is done. This one is a straight breach of contract when nothing has been done. And um, the second one is an anticipatory breach. An anticipatory breach, you know, this is where someone says, I am supposed to deliver this by date B. So in, in A, we said the person fails to deliver. So on the subject of the contract, this is what we have subjected for. I mean, uh, contracted for. So the subject of the contract has not been performed. Where the subject of the contract is not performed, we simply say there has been a breach of contract. Nothing has been performed. In an anticipatory breach, this is another essential element of the contract, duration, time. The contract must be performed by this day. Where it is not performed by that day, the contract would have been breached. So this party now tells you ahead of time to say, I'm supposed to do this in two weeks' time. I will not be able to do so. I anticipate so this is an anticipatory breach. Or you could have a scenario whereby one would say, um, I'm getting married in August during Hero's Day. 
those are um, wedding days, you know, during the holidays. And you have already paid for a cake. You have paid for your wedding gown. You have ordered your suit from um, a, th- a middleman who's going to get the suit from Dubai or China. And um, this person now turns around and says, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, as far as the suit is concerned, uh, I'm only going to be able to have the suit in September or in December. That is an anticipated breach. So what you are now looking at is this particular performance is tied to a day. There is no way I'm going to have a wedding in September because I have relations, I have guests that I've already invited. They're coming from all over. So what you do where there is that anticipated breach, this is where the innocent party can go by way of rescission. We're going to discuss what that rescission is. So if it is a material, a material breach that will arise, the innocent party is going to mitigate their losses and start working on plan B or plan C. We're going to look at that later on. Then D is defective performance. What is a defective performance? It's where the task has been done, but what has been delivered does not work. What has been delivered is as good as it was not delivered. That is a defective performance. It's a breach of contract because this is what we contracted for. It's a quality issue. So we looked at the quality of the item by gained for. It must be fit for purpose. If it doesn't work, even though you're saying you've done the job, it doesn't work. In that case, it's as good as the job has not been done. And then uh, the last one is partial defective performance. A partial defective performance is whereby you're going to have something done, but it does not seem to go as far as it should because some pertinent aspects of the the item are not in place. When those items are not in place, what this does is that it amounts to a breach of quality. You have a car that you've just sent to the mechanic. He says, oh, your your, your car is boiling because you have a problem with the radiator. Let me attend to your radiator. He fixes the radiator. When the radiator is done, guess what? You drive out, but every two kilometers, you'll have to stop and pour water and wait for it to cool down. That is something that we would call a a breach in terms of um, the quality. It is partial defective performance. It should not boil. You are, um, let me be gender sensitive without being patronizing. You go to a salon and uh, someone does your nice weave, but your weave is hanging uh, from one side such that, you know, we can see your nice afro on this side. The weave starts from there and goes that way. Yes, it is a weave, but that's not how we intended it to be. So it is partially defective. It is a weave. It is on the head, but it is not covering the whole head. It's covering part of it. That's a partial defect. So in that kind of a scenario, it's a breach of contract and it's a quality breach. So um, now having discussed these four items that we have said, these are breaches. How does then one recover from these? How do you do away with this breach? Now you're going to find two ways of doing so that I would say the first one is a self-help kind of um, a response to a breach. How do you go about this? There is what is known as a mutuality principle and a retention of performance. They are coupled. A mutuality principle is that when you um, contract someone to to perform a task, what you do is uh, ordinarily the person performs the task and then you pay them. Now, this is the corresponding performance. There is a mutual performance there. Because of the mutuality of this performance, What happens is when the person has done the job and you pay, when they do not do the job, what do you do? You do not pay. So you retain your performance. You do not act on your side. Now, the advantage of not paying is that the person is going to complete the job first and then seek to be paid. So this becomes a stopgap. This becomes a valve that helps you. But you're going to have a challenge whereby you are the one who performs the duty. And then when you are now seeking payment, money does not come through. I know some of us have contracted and you have been told you deliver the goods first and cash is going to be paid out to you in 14 days. 
So you go and deliver seven days. Come, maybe it's supposed to be seven days payment. Seven days lapse, there's no payment. 14 days lapse, there's no payment. And, and now you turn to a beggar for work that you have done. So this, this kind of a setup is um, skewed. It, it does not always work. It only works where you're the one who is supposed to pay. Or it, it, it is supposed to work where you're paid so that you can perform the duty thereafter. So if you're not paid, you don't go on site to start the work. It, it, this is in, in construction. So someone is supposed to, to buy, let's say they're supposed to buy the, the implements. They're supposed to, for, for farming, if they don't buy the implements, you don't go on site. They're supposed to buy the material for construction. If they don't buy that, you don't go on site. They're supposed to pay um, at certain intervals. If they do not pay, you do not go on site. That is a retention of performance. Now, besides the retention of performance, you would have a scenario whereby, for example, there is a scenario where an anticipatory breach has arisen. You are told this suit, which is supposed, this cake, which is supposed to be um, delivered in August, will only be ready in December. So if the cake will be ready in December, surely the person who is contracting with you has an option of rescinding the contract. So when they rescind the contract, they are basically nullifying the contract. So when you want to go by way of nullifying the contract, you want to make sure that there has been a material breach. It will be a material breach. Not every annoyance amounts to a basis of rescission. You have an appointment and uh, there are some people who were born late. They went to school late. They matured late. They will ever be late for everything <laughs> until they are late. So when you go there and you now have a contractual uh, engagement, but this person you contracted with just can't keep time. Does this mean you now have a basis of rescinding from that contract? You might not. You might not. It's not every annoyance that sets up grounds for a rescission of contract. It has to be a material issue, not just anything. So uh, no, notice that when we spoke about materiality, we did talk about this in distinguishing all the cases. So for one case to be set apart, to be distinguished, it has to have a material difference. For you to rescind a contract, have a material breach before you. Don't just wear your, emotion on your emotions on your sleeves and become a porcupine. Should anyone touch you, you're ready to go and prick and be all over the place. What the court wants to look at is, is this a reasonable behavior? Is this a reasonable um, reaction to what is happening? So one thing that would uh, safeguard so that you don't find yourself thinking you are rescinding a contract and then you find yourself in breach of a contract because that can happen. So the first thing you need to prove is that you did everything in your power to make it work. Number two, you also presented the other party with an opportunity to remedy the defect, to remedy the breach. If you can prove these two, yes, you can go on and gun for uh, a rescission of contract. And remember, I, I am saying if you can prove, if you can prove, the issue is not so much about what happened. Many of us narrate so well the ordeal, but the question is, can you prove it? If you cannot prove it, then you cannot claim that it is so. The court is interested, yes, in the truth, but the truth that can be proven, not just the truth that can be narrated. So ask yourself this question, can I prove it? If you cannot prove it, think twice. Think twice before you act. Now, lastly, let us go and look at the judicial remedies for a breach of contract, and then we'll wrap it up from here. On uh, the judicial remedies, this is where now the court is going to intervene. The court is going to make sure that something is done or something is not done. The first remedy that we can have is an interdict or an injunction. These are big words, interdict or injunction. An application for an interdict or an injunction is basically an application for someone or a party to desist from doing certain things. So an injunction or an interdict stops the offending party. Stop there. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. Stop there. Stop what you're doing. That's an interdict. That's an injunction. It stops the other person. 
So you cannot have a situation where you want to have a positive interdict. An interdict is negative. It is negative. So um, you, you, you can have a lot of examples on what we can ask to be um, stopped by the offending party. And the basis for that, we're not going to go into examples. So let's look at the second one. The second one is positive. And this one is specific performance. A specific performance is the one that is positive. It compels the party to do something. An interdict restrains. A, a performance uh, finding compels. So it compels this person to go into action. So as far as the obligation is concerned, you could have a scenario whereby one is then ordered to perform the obligation of the contract. And when they are ordered to perform the, the, the obligation of the contract, going back to what we, 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 we spoke about, there must be an alternative for payment of damages so that we do not clash with our earlier discussion on the will theory. So this one is straightforward. So when the court is going to make an order of specific performance, it is going to consider some of these things. I'm just going to mention them in passing. Number one, it is going to consider that this particular item that should be performed is supposed to be precise and not vague. Certainty, you remember? Certainty, we discussed this. As far as custom is concerned, it must be certain. We also discussed this uh, when we're looking at, um, was it um, judicial precedence? Certainty, that is an interesting part. And now here it is cost differently, precise and not vague. It must be certain. So there must be a legal certainty there. The issue to be performed must be known. It must be clear. And number two, it must not be impossible to perform. So it is a contract that has not been frustrated for it to be enforced. Number three, not causing exceptional hardship or resulting in injustice. What is this? The court has a primary responsibility to ensure that justice is done. So the legal proceedings must result in justice being done. So an exceptional hardship is one that is going to inflict undue pain upon this person. The court is not keen on doing so. Number four, it should not be highly of a personal nature. So why does it have to be something that is not of a personal nature? Remember the assumptions we discussed. Two assumptions, personal agreements, the court is not keen to come in there. Commercial agreements, it will readily jump in. And then the last one, it must be uniquely restricted to the data and cannot be sourced elsewhere. So what should the court be looking at here? The court is saying you need to mitigate your losses. Number one, yes, 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 the offer was made to the debtor. It has been made to a specific person. But when we come to specific performance, it must be something that can only be accessed there. If it can be accessed elsewhere, mitigate your losses. You can go elsewhere. Why? Why? Well, what is your issue with this particular person? You can take it from elsewhere. Right. Catch the next pass. That's the kind of, uh, kind of uh, attitude that the court is going to say. Take. And then on C, an action for payment. This one is straightforward. Doesn't need explanation. You are owing money. Money has not been paid. What is the specific performance payment of money? So you cannot say pay money or alternatively pay damages. No, the damages are still going to be equivalent to the money that is owed. So just pay the money. That's the action for performance, for, for payment. And then the last thing that the court is going to do is award damages. I want to look at just three uh, damages that um, would arise. The first set of damages are the actual losses. The actual losses are what you incur because of either a breach of contract, what you incur because of an anticipatory breach, what you incur because of a defective performance or a partial defect. So you, you are supposed to quantify and prove what you have lost. When you prove that which you have lost, you then um, cover that from the party that has offended in the contract. And if it is a scenario, you could have some scenarios where um, if this had been done, let's say you're running a restaurant and you know that you collect so much. So for this period, I was supposed to have the restaurant up and running. I was supposed to have my lodge up and running. I was supposed to have my bus up and running. And I have lost seven days. We quantify actual loss based on the average takings. This is how much I was going to receive had the contract been done. So that is an actual loss. You get um, reimbursement for that. 
Now you also have consequential losses. Consequential losses are you have already contracted that you are going to uh, ferry children from home to school and you are supposed to get um, $100 out of that. So these people have already paid you for the month and this um, mechanic of yours decides not to do the job. They botch the job. When the job is botched, guess what you have to do? Now that you have already made a commitment, a contractual commitment, the fact that it has become difficult does not make it impossible. What should you do? Hire someone else's uh, vehicle. And when you're going to hire that vehicle, guess what? These people, they always know when you are in, um, you are in a fix, you are right for business. And now they charge you $150. So the $50 difference, that is a consequential loss. You're going to recover it from the person who has breached the contract. That is a consequential loss. The last one, just to explain this, is the punitive damages. Punitive damages are the retribution. It is the court that simply says, the sanctity of contract we want people to know and take it seriously. When people are flippant, when they enter into contracts, as the court, we are going to register our displeasure. We can punish you for that. And then punitive damages can come on top. So those punitive damages are not being levied for the person who was in the contract. The court is now doing so, so that it makes a statement. It protects the rule of law. And to protect that rule of law, you may be fined extra. You may find yourself paying because of that. So these are the damages that would um, basically be looking at. But the principle that the court goes by is one should not win a lottery through the court. You cannot go there and say you contracted for um, an agreement that was worth maybe, let's say, uh, 2,000 United States dollars. Then you come back from your damages. You now have 200,000 US dollars. That is unreasonable. It's absurd. So people are not going to be enriched beyond what they would have gained from the contract. So when the courts intervene, when the legal system intervenes, it intervenes so that it gives you what you agreed to. You did not agree to make 200000 out of the contract. You agreed to make 2000 out of the contract. So the court will make sure that you are basically going to receive the 2000 you are going to be a reimbursed for the trouble you would have suffered in the process. So this is where some of those um, uh, claims become a little more compli complicated, where someone is going to claim for psychological torture. These are very interesting claims. I'm not sure whether they will be easy to prove uh, that you, you suffered how much psychologically because of uh, the infringement on the contract. So these are the items that we, we have looked at so far. I'll just uh, leave it here. For now, and hope this is just uh, enough for you to uh, come to an understanding on. This is the sanctity of contract. What have we said in essence? The court is going to interfere to make sure that duties are performed as agreed. Yes, you impose the rights and obligations upon yourselves. You have come to an agreement. For legal certainty, the court is going to come in to tell you what you agreed upon. The court is going to come in to tell you what the contract is. The court is going to come in to ensure the specific performance of the things that you have agreed to. And those who are doing the wrong things within that agreement, they are interdicted. They are told to stop. So these are the issues that we have looked at basically. And for our next installment, we'll be looking at the freedom of contract, particularly focusing on the other types of contracts and how the government will come in and uh, regulate the freedom of contract. It is not an exclusive hands-off for the government. Parties may say it is between the two of us. We are free and uh, consenting parties. Therefore, the government should not have any say. That is more fiction than practical. The government is always going to come in and interfere with freedom of contract where possible. Now, let us meet um, in our next installment. Until then, may God bless you. May God keep you. May he prosper you in all your endeavors. God bless and good day.